Too much material for this one service, and I know I don't have another Sunday to do it because next week our, our schedule is different, and um, I am just going to be doing a brief devotional next week on a couple of verses that I would like to have us think about uh, at the point where Ruth and I retire. And it's something that uh, is needed for all of us in the times in which we live. But as I finished up, I worked many, many hours because the extra hours went into uh, putting this together for a PowerPoint. And I had a learning curve because I had a, one of the newer versions of PowerPoint, and so I've been making discoveries right along, but I don't think I've been making the discoveries qu quick enough to be able to uh, perfect what I would like to see on the screen. And so last week, I had a couple of typos in there and uh, went from one slide to the next and didn't have uh, the few words that were needed to finish that line. And you've been so gracious in putting up with uh, my mistakes. And so uh, today, I don't know what my strategy is going to be because uh, there are 20 slides with information on it in addition to what we've already done. There's a total of 64. And what I'd like to share with you is, be, since we're not going to get through all this information today, if there are any of you who would like to have this study sent to your email, if you have a PowerPoint program, then you can bring it up and uh, read it and look it over, and if you would ever like to use it as a resource. So, if you would like to have that happen, I would just need your name and your email, and that your email would be written so clearly that I cannot misunderstand it, okay? Uh, a lot of people write out their email, and uh, they have quick handwriting, like they're writing a check, and uh, yes, Dawn? Uh, text it to me, that would be fabulous, or you can hand it to me on a piece of paper or whatever. You're right, though, it is clearer. And um, so I hope that uh, uh, on my next to the last Sunday that you'll be patient with me and that um, if you've thought that we've been more like in a classroom in these last uh, six, eight weeks, you're right. And has it been more like uh, Bible lectures instead of uh, the preaching, teaching style that I've done, you're right, but there are certain things that I really hope can be embedded in our hearts and minds so that when you might come upon preaching the compromises with regard to what was going on there on the cross and happening to our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, if you hear that God was separated from God or that that God turned his back on the Son or that Jesus Christ died a spiritual death on the cross, that your ears would perk up and your heart would long to get tuned in with the Word of God, and that uh, you would begin to remember some of the things that we have dealt with because you won't find that material in the Bible, you'll find that in the imagination and the thought process of the many pastors, too many as far as I'm concerned, and Bible professors who perhaps teach those things um, that are theory uh, and essentially try to portray them as fact. And again, I would just say that these 64 slides of this PowerPoint presentation are only the tip of the iceberg, and uh, John Kozlowski has written a book, Pushing Against the Mystery. Uh, I don't know if it's seven or eight dollars, whatever it is, you can ask John. 
it would be worth your while buying that book if you have not bought it yet because he deals with all of these things and more uh, in that work and does it uh, with a tremendous uh, clarity and scholarship both. Uh, he has a technical version where there's more of the original language in there, but he has another uh, a version of the book where you don't have a lot of the technical things in there, and so that surely would be easier for you to read. So just keep that in mind because uh, I've looked that book over and gone through it, and uh, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a, a work of biblical art, and um, uh, I deeply appreciate it and thank him that he went uh, and carefully followed through to get his uh, Master of Theology, and that was the consummating project of his studies in order to put that thesis together. So uh, talk to him about it when you get the opportunity. Right now, I'd like to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. When you think about why the Lord Jesus Christ had to go to the cross, he had to go there because of the emergency that entered into the human race and completely subjugated every human being in this world and submerge us in a problem of sin from which you and I nor anyone else in the world could ever escape. And that's what brings about wrong thinking, wrong ideas, lustful thoughts, competition that is filled with envy and sometimes hatred and contempt. Sometimes this leads to gossip. Other times the lust leads to the pornography and it leads to the uh, adultery uh, in the mind sometimes, but also acted out. Uh, all kinds of fornication, which is a general term for uh, sexual sin. And then the matter of a person's pride and the way people think about themselves and uh, having a, a much higher opinion of themselves than what they should have in the sense that, that we are sinners and lost uh, in our estate as we are now. And if it weren't for the intervention of God by sending His only begotten Son into the world to deal with this entrenched and insidious sin problem inside of you and me, where would we be? Well, I can tell you what our future would be. It would be hell. It would be a lake of fire. And it's something that, that we work on very hard and earn because of what is hidden away there in our hearts and bursts forth in bad behavior and sometimes awfully evil language. I, I've been listening to people, and, and including myself, so I, I can't just say other people, but myself. And uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, Christians cursing, we have come up with substitute curse words. And so one of the ones I was thinking about was the word heck, and you know what that is for. But uh, the thing of it is, uh, there's a lot of uh, people in this country whose last name is heck. So uh, you, you might be able to get away with that with somebody and say, you know, well, I was only referring to somebody's name. Uh, oh, what the heck, uh, referring to so-and-so or whatever. But uh, when it comes to other things, um, uh, the idea of uh, friggin, I've gone through this with you before, uh, or crap, uh, and, but crap, I told you before, comes from a Latin word that means chaff. So you might be able to slip through that one easy too. Uh, because when I say that word, and I do 
sometimes when I get upset, uh, I like to think that I'm spiritual enough to have it mean chaff and, and not mean the other thing. Uh, so you can sin by rationalizing in that way. And so we have these substitutes that we use when we get angry. And there are some believers, and they may be true believers, uh, who when they get angry uh, or upset about something uh, or they want to emphasize something in their conversation, don't even bother with the substitute words. They just go right for those awful words to begin with. And what about taking the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ in vain? Because God tells us not to take his name in vain. You see, deep inside of us, we have a terrible problem. And there's nothing that we ourselves can do to help ourselves. A lot of people in this world think they can, and so uh, they write a lot of self-help books. But in Matthew 15, Jesus said in verse 16, are you also yet without understanding? As he talks about people who cared more about external rules and about the washing of the hands and, and what they eat and all that sort of stuff instead of the heart issues. And he says in verse 17, do you not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in the mouth goeth into the stomach and is cast out into the draft? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Now, if you would please go over to Galatians chapter 5. Because we might say, well, these are the things that usually happen, uh, and mostly so, among unbelievers. I mean, after all, they haven't met Christ yet, and they haven't received that new nature, and they are not a new creation in Christ, and, and so on and on you can think about these things and rationalize. But in Galatians 5, Paul is primarily writing to those who have professed their faith in Christ and he says in verse 16 but I say then uh, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh the old Adam the old sin nature that which is rotten inside of us for the flesh the old nature lusts and wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would and so there are a lot of Christians who are hung up in life and not getting the victory that was won for them by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. He defeated that old sin nature. He conquered sin at the cross. Our Savior was not conquered by sin on the cross. We have a victorious Savior. And so we don't want to be in the place so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's a battleground going on within our souls. And you, with your renewed will in the Lord Jesus Christ have to make a choice and that choice is there on your plate every day and every night of your life whether you want it or not and that is that old Adam is going to link with the things of this world and will be available to the influence of Satan or the demonic and this new nature that we have that will be controlled by the Holy Spirit there is going to be a, a uh, conflict between the two. And the way that conflict is settled is by the choice that you make. Will I submit to the full control of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life? And will I give the contents of my mind and, and the things that come out my mouth uh, over to the Lord? Or will I subserve and turn away from the Lord momentarily in my life and begin to serve that old Adam. And if you say it can't happen, then follow this. In verse 18 it says, but if you are being led, that's an important addition right here 
uh, because it is in the original text. And it is something that the, the Holy Spirit does for us. He does the leading. Too many times we want to take the reins and do the leading. Anytime you do that, you're on a dead end street all the time. And you always come out a loser. But when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we're following the one who is the victory. And he's the one who has the power in order for us to be able to overcome. And so if you are being led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We cannot list those Ten Commandments and then just with resolve say, I am going to follow these today and I will not fail. You'll fail. Because if you do anything in the flesh, if it never turns out wholesome, positive, spiritual, and pleasing to the Lord. And so consequently, look out for the flesh, the old Adam. Because the works of the flesh, verse 19, are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness of any kind sexually, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife. Listen, people would say, well, I'm not into any kind of sorcery. Well, do you ever read uh, in the newspaper or go online and look for some kind of fortune telling? Uh, or do you get involved in listening to people or making predictions? And I mean even people who are, for example, leaders of the 700 Club, where he is sitting there making prophecies. He just did it the other day. I tuned in. And it's such an arrogance. I say this and this will happen. He has been proven to be a false prophet and even a false teacher who believes in an old earth, who believes a number of things contrary to Scripture, and yet there he is with his $250,000 racehorses, including his mansions, because there are so many people out there in, the, in the America who are so, so dull spiritually that they will send whatever money into him he begs for there on TV. What a, what a sad state of affairs uh, in the, in the so-called church of Jesus Christ. And people are caught up with that emotionally, and they don't check things out as they should by the word. And so listen carefully. Idolatry, sorcery, verse 20, hatred, strife, jealousy, wrath, where anger is acted out, factions, divisions, in other words, seditions, uprisings, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and all things like that. Of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That is a warning that was written to a local church and telling people, look out because you can be brought down at any moment if our eyes are not fixed on the one who is our savior and realizing that in him is the power to overcome the temptations, the leadings of Satan, the yearnings and the lusts of that old Adam and eyeing the world and the things that seem so attractive Jesus Christ gives us the kind of sight that helps us understand what's right and what's wrong and to make sure that we follow him. Now then, when we study about the cross, if we hear somebody preaching that Jesus somehow or other uh, became a sinner at the cross or uh, suffered spiritual death or the father turned away from him and couldn't look on him or that God the father was separated from God the son while he was on the cross they're all wrong teachings now we've gone through in some detail 
the whole matter of God being separated or the Father being separated from the Son. God separated from God. We want to deal partly with today, and I may have to skip some slides, so you're going to have, this will be kind of a, a uh, choppy presentation today, and so I hope you'll stick with me anyhow. Did the Father turn his back on the Son because he could not look on sin? That's a big issue in many pulpits and with many pastors today. There is fallacious teaching on the Father toward the Son. Did the Father turn his back on the Son at the cross? It appears that many Bible teachers, conservative pastors, and professors hold the position that the Father turned away from the Son and fellowship was broken since the Father could not look on sin. Their motto is taken from Habakkuk 1.13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Now let's remember basic theology 101, and you may say, I never had theology 101. Well, you're having it now, partly. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are indivisibly one from everlasting to everlasting. If the Father could not look on sin, think about this now, how could the Son look on sin, let alone bear it at the cross? <clears throat> the Son, likewise, is fully God. So he was on the cross, how could he look, look at it? Hence, how could the Father and Spirit not look on sin while the Son could? Jesus was fully holy here on earth, and he saw sin all around him. He sat and ate with sinners and saw them sin. God saw sin throughout the Word of God. First in the anarchy, anarchy of Lucifer, as he challenged God's eternity, authority, majesty, and uniqueness as the eternal triunity. He rebelled against the very holiness of God. God saw Adam and Eve fall into sin and sought them, clothed them, and continued to speak with them. God saw the sin of Cain in the murder of his brother Abel. God saw the continual utter sinfulness of mankind in the days of violence, evil, and corruption of all flesh upon the earth. God saw the Tower of Babel and came down in theophany form. He is so just. God is so just and righteous in his pronouncement of judgment that he even inspected in person on earth this matter of the Tower of Babel. God is so absolutely just and fair. Did God see Pharaoh's evil against Egypt or against Israel in Egypt? Did God see Aaron with the people make a golden calf and get naked? for their desert orgy while Moses was on Mount Sinai? Did God see Israel's evil in the wilderness and especially at Kadesh Barnea when they said, we're not going in to the land of Canaan? Too many giants there. They're bigger than God. Note the following few verses in addition to what we have just examined about what God sees. Proverbs 15.3 the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Jeremiah 23, 24, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 20, verse 12, But, O Lord of hosts, who testeth the righteous and seeth the heart and mind, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Yes, where did they get the idea that the Lord could not, the Father could not look on the Son? Thou art a pure eyes and to behold evil. God has beheld evil from Lucifer forward. Job 28, 24, for he, God, looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth unto the whole heaven. Therefore, why was it that the Father supposedly could not look on the Son and thus turned his back on him or hid his face from him, as they say? Why do so many espouse this view learned in Bible schools and Bible seminaries, but perhaps never biblically and exegetically examine the question for themselves? First, if the viewpoint of the Father not being able to look on evil is built on the text in Habakkuk, 
then the context of Habakkuk 1, 12, and 13 is ignored to the detriment of the interpreter. You see, Habakkuk was wrestling with the fact that the Babylonians uh, to the east were a rising nation and power. And the Israelites had been warned, these Babylonians are going to come and they are going to take captive uh, the people of Judah and they are going to remove them to Babylon except for a tiny little remnant of poor people uh, in the land of Israel. And therefore, understand, you cannot continue in your idolatry, Israel, and in all your immoralities, because the Lord will take and use another nation to judge you. And this is what Habakkuk was wrestling with. He was saying, Lord, how can you, uh, as evil as Israel is, how can you take someone uh, that is secular, that is pagan, that is so uh, steeped in idolatry and bring them over to judge us. Thou art of pure eyes than to behold such an evil. So I probably just told you what's on here. But take a look. Habakkuk was raising a question and challenge to God that asked him, how could you look on? While a people, Babylonians, more evil than Israel, would murder, pillage, destroy, and take many into captivity. You are of pure eyes than to behold such an evil. But God has repeatedly through history warned Israel that he would use other nations to reprove, chase, and correct wayward, idolatrous Israel. If they wanted their idols, their Satanism and their demonism and licentious behavior, then they would learn what it was like to be under the dominion of the demonic idolaters and discover what tyrannical taskmasters they would be, as in the Babylonians. Seen in Habakkuk 2, 1 to 4, where the Lord told uh, Habakkuk, the just one shall live by his faith. Habakkuk now, after hearing from the Lord, expected national reproof as the Lord instructed him and the Lord said in that uh, vision uh, that the vision which will be laid out on tablets, the inscribed word, is the message Habakkuk needs in order to be the messenger who takes it to Israel in that time of emergency. So he told Habakkuk essentially to run because things were urgent. And you know what? Every day that you and I live is urgent. It is urgent that the day begins with the Lord. It is urgent that the day continues with the Lord. It is urgent into the evening that our thoughts are on God. It is urgent that our last thoughts before we fall asleep are of the Lord. And that's when the Lord is governing our lives. Those things will happen. You might say to me, well, I get so busy uh, with the tasks that I have to do. I have things to unload or I have things to write. I have projects to get done. But do you know what? Underneath all the busyness and even all the uh, thinking that you may have to do, creative thinking, lying underneath of that when the Holy Spirit is in charge of your lives will be thoughts that just gravitate to the Lord even throughout the most intense day in your work or with regard to other projects. The person who lifts up his soul in pride within himself, as was true of Israel, is not upright. And so God's essentially saying this, focus on the fact, Habakkuk, that the justified one shall live by his faith through this ordeal. Habakkuk got it. And in the third chapter of Habakkuk, he writes poetry that reveals that he's casting everything on the Lord and he's learned to wait on the Lord. Now, the fact that God can't look on evil uh, and is applied to the cross is wrong. Think about it. Is not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit omniscient and omnipresent? How could the Father and Spirit look away or turn their back on the Son and not see or know what was happening? The seeming derelict cry of the Son to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, calls attention to the fact 
that the son had to bear all the sins of the whole world in his pain and agony. There was no way out until all sin was dealt with and thus full salvation was purchased. The cry of our Savior is real as it calls attention to all the incomprehensible suffering of the son. He had to be abandoned or forsaken by the Father to the work of that cross. There was no other way. In the councils of eternity, there was no other way. As the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit considered this together ahead of the creation of the world, there was no other way that when man would fall into sin, that the Son would have to come into the world and go to that cross in order to be able to redeem us. If there had been any other way, don't you think the Lord would have done it? And so he had to be abandoned or forsaken by the Father to the cross to purchase eternal redemption, but he was never forsaken by the Father while he was on that cross. In the councils of the triune God, there could be no other way for this sacrificial, sin-bearing event to occur. Everything the Son did perfectly pleased the father and we're told that in isaiah 53 10 to 11 the incarnated son experienced something from the human standpoint that was never faced before which was the bearing of all the world's sin in his body upon that cross you have to remember that he was doing this out of sacrificial love all the hurt and the pain and the anguish he went through was for you and me who were going through the pain and anguish and hurt of our own sin but we're incapable of doing anything about it. We were captives of sin and of Satan. Who would set us free? No one could do that but the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was an excruciating encounter when the ugliness and utter filth of all sin was borne by him. Did he become a sinner thereby? If he did, he failed and we have no savior. Furthermore, even a moment of defeat in the fight against sin would have nullified all the rest of the work on the cross. How then could Jesus declare, it is finished, which carries the truth or the idea that it remains finished? Was Jesus victimized by sin the way one of the dumb animals were in the Old Testament? Those bulls, goats, and calves supplied the mere illustration and picture by the shedding of their blood concerning what would be alone more than fulfilled in the person of the incarnated Son. In fact, Jesus Christ is called the antitype regarding all the types relative to the offerings of bulls, goats, lambs, rams, and so on. Jesus was the antitype. What do we mean? That is to say, he is both in the place of all the types and pictures of the Old Testament, but also he's against those types due to their complete insufficiency to totally picture what Jesus would do and obviously to remove any sin. And so here's the scripture for it. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins, as Pastor Graf read this morning. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body, a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus Christ ends all the types as the fulfillment of them, and he is the one who adds infinite meaning against their total limitations. After all, The scripture said that the result of Jesus redeeming once for all sacrifice at the cross superseded all pictures, types, and illustrations and yielded the truth that, for you and me, where sin abounded, hey, sin abounds in your life. Sin abounds in my life. And when you come to know the Lord, you'll hate that. And when you mess up, and you exhibit wrong behavior and you're not nice to another person or there's something contrary between you and another person and by the way this goes 
big time for within so-called Christian marriages. That's the trap we're in because of the awfulness of our sin. Can Jesus Christ provide the answer for that? Yes. But only if we want him to be so in charge of our lives. And listen to me. I firmly and fully believe that if you don't give the charge and the leadership over to the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, He will, if you are truly born again, bring some discipline or chastisement or scourging into your life to tell you that He is Lord and Savior so that He can correct your behavior. Now the issue is, will you agree with Him about that? Because there's no greater peace in your heart and your life and mine than when we agree with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the father couldn't look on his son on the cross. How could such a thing be true in a savior who faced any defeat on the cross that he would come up with grace that superabounded against sin that abounded? There's infinitely more grace than there is our sin. You get that? Okay, there's some heads nodding. Now, I know they're nodding and I see they're awake, but there's other heads nodding, but uh, it's not in agreement. <laughs> Here on the next to the last Sunday of... <laughs> I've had people, and probably... You know, if this sounds like a lecture, which it is, then, you know, people have a tendency to get sleepy. Uh, I need to catch up in my own notes here to uh, where I have it. So I have the scripture. After all, up here, the scripture said that the result of Jesus redeeming once for all sacrifice at the cross superseded all pictures, types, and illustrations, yielded the truth where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Second, the question contains the innuendo, that is, God can't look on sin. He can't look on the Son, therefore. The question contains the innuendo that the Father is not pleased with the state of his eternal Son on the cross. Yet again, read Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord. To bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, you. The Father saw you, and the Son saw you ahead of time. And said, it is worth everything that I will go through in taking the the sinful coming together of all the filth of the sewers of the earth that converged at Calvary. And Christ did that out of the most profound love, a love so great that we honestly can't grasp it all, but it's there and it's for us. It says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. In resurrection, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul. He shall see his suffering and shall be satisfied. Everything that the son did at the cross was right. It was exact. It was perfect. It was an offering without spot to God. That's what the scripture says. He didn't become iniquity there in the sense of iniquitous. He, didn't, he, he became a sin offering. He didn't become a sinner. This is important. And so John 8, 28 to 30 says, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. 
Now, why could not the Father look on the Son? For what he was doing on the cross pleased the Father. Sometimes it's, it's probably not a right attitude, but there are some times when I hear a pastor preach that and I'm out there in the congregation, I feel like I just want to walk up and take a couple verses and say, would you read these? I don't. But do you know something? You will hear this from different churches. And it is disheartening. He says, as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things in John 8. For I do always those things that please him. As Jesus spoke these words, many believed on him. In John 10, 17 and 18. Therefore doth my father love me. Did you get that? He didn't turn his face away from me. Therefore doth my father love me. Because I laid down my life that I might take it up again in, in the resurrection. Meaning, no man takes it from me. Think of our Lord. Perfect agreement with the father voluntarily going to the cross and knowing what was going to all be laid on him. Everything fractured and broken and shattered and wrong about your life and my life and the life of everybody in the world and the whole of the human race would be laid on Jesus Christ in those six hours. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it up again in the resurrection. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now listen carefully. In John eleven forty one 41 to 44, as Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, John writes this. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now listen. Father, thou hast heard me. Did not the Father hear the Son where the greater miracle of sacrificially dying on the cross occurred when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why would the Father hear the Son with this great miracle in the resurrection of Lazarus, but now the Father wouldn't be hearing the Son because he couldn't even bear to look upon the Son for the things that were going on or taking place. It's not only the Father who is pure, it's the Son who is pure, it's the Holy Spirit who is pure. If sin could make the Lord Jesus Christ into a failure or a sinner, we have no Savior. That needs to be repeated over and over again. But Jesus said, I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about, wrapped around with a napkin or a cloth. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Since the Father heard the Son with this great miracle, you can be sure the Father heard and answered the Son in the greater miracle while Christ was on the cross. And Psalm 22 witnesses that the Father heard the Son, did not forsake Him on the cross, and looked on with His approving heart as the Son was winning salvation for a lost world. Could the Father not look on the Son because He was tainted or infected by sin? Up here? Suppose that is the case. Let's acknowledge that the eternal Son is still Almighty God on the cross and co-eternally co-equal with the Father. Therefore, even He, Jesus Christ, could not then look upon the sin which He was bearing in His own body on that tree. That's where the logic goes. Well, it's not logic. It's just thought patterns that are heading down the wrong trail. How is that possible? The deity of the Son is never separated from His humanity in the one personality of the God-man, the divine human redeemer. If we even hint that the Father turned his back on the Son, it is then implied that something happened to the Son that the Father, and therefore the Holy Spirit, could not approve. 
God has looked at the sin and sins of the people of this world ever since Adam and Eve sinned. Proverbs 15, 3, that we already looked at, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding good and evil. As the Lord rebukes King Asa in the Old Testament for relying on the Syrians when he had formerly trusted the Lord, the prophet Hanani reports from the Lord, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, King Asa, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. The son always does what the father does in obedience to him. Thus, how does the son look away from himself? What is the father unable to look upon that he asks his son to do? If Habakkuk's question is applied to the father-son eternal relationship, then what broke in their relationship that would mandate the father to turn his back on the son? Basic theology, here we go again, should have taught us that the triune God is indivisible. So there can't be any separation between the father and son. That is an unbiblical attack on the unity of the triune Godhead. We would wind up with at least, with at least ditheists believing in two gods, or actually tritheists where we believe in three gods, three separate gods. But that would make for three infinites. Are you with me? Or are you glazing over in your eyes now? Okay. Uh, if your eyes are open, I'm asking you to, to use your mind and uh, help me out here because I'm struggling. I've struggled in putting together this, this whole study because I wanted it to be some final things as reminders. Please, don't be dismayed or don't be deceived when you hear preaching that would be contrary to what the Word of God actually says. It's so, it's so exceedingly important. Think about this. Three infinites. It is an utter impossibility for there to be room for another or competing infinite being. It's just impossible. One infinite takes up all. All right? Where does it say in the Word of God that the Father and the Holy Spirit in their oneness with the Son could not look upon this inbearing work of the Savior? Where does it say that? Well, they run to Habakkuk. Could the Father not look upon the continual victory of his beloved Son over all sin? In light of the context of the whole Bible, this argument that the fellowship of Father and Son was broken reduces unchangeable truth to a level of the absurd. Third, did the father have to look away or turn his back on the son because there were moments of defeat for the son on the cross? Did sin at some point somehow overcome the son and he was not victorious from the beginning of his sacrifice to the end of it? How then could Jesus Christ be the one to defeat all sin if he were overcome by any sin on the cross and not the victor over it, over it at all times? Christ Jesus was bearing the sin of the whole world, not just in the last three hours of darkness that came over that scene, but in all of those six hours. That darkness and quaking became a momentous event to remind sinners that they had unjustly crucified the sinless God-man who was on the cross confronting and conquering sin in his suffering and blood sacrifice. This is right there in Hebrews 9, 12, 25 to 28. The guilt of all mankind is indicted by what happened on that cross, that the sinless one died for the sinner, the altogether righteous one for the unrighteous, the perfect one for the imperfect. Jesus Christ bore our sin. Boy, when I just, Lord, help me to focus on that. And when I begin to pray, and when Ruth and I pray together, I like to start out, always start out, Lord, what you've done for us, why get into all the petitions that you're going to ask the Lord without, first of all, just spending time with the Lord in thanksgiving because the magnitude of what he did on the cross and his resurrection and his ascension and his intercession before the throne of grace so overwhelms our minds 
that the Lord wants us not to hurry on through the prayer and the time we spend with him. The guilt of all mankind is indicted by what happened on the cross. In the last sentence up here, as we see it, Jesus Christ bore our sin, but was not infected by our sin as Adam was infected by way of Eve and Satan. In our Savior's inexplicable sacrificial work on the cross, he won a moment-by-moment victory over every aspect of sin once for all. He shouted, it is finished. But it was not finished. If there were something happening whereby the Father could not look on the eternal Son. This is another myth spawned in the halls of Bible colleges and not questioned or challenged by many students, even when they grow older in the ministry and were supposed to have gone deeper into the scholarship of the Word of God. In the Old Testament, the atonement means covering and not the taking away of sin. Prior to the cross, forgiveness was obtained upon the down payment of what Christ would yet do at Calvary. And so Romans 3.25 and Hebrews 9.15, we don't have time to look it up, uh, tell us that when Christ died on the cross, he also died for all the sins that were there in the Old Testament in all of past history. For those who had put their faith in the promise of God, and that's how they could be redeemed before Christ came and went to the cross. They banked on the promise of the coming Redeemer. Fourth, did Jesus Christ become a sinner on the cross? That would have meant his defeat and failure of the whole of the Godhead. We then would be without a Savior, and the total sovereign God would not actually be the sovereign. Such is an impossible thought. Why do you think authors, uh, or I mean, who do you think authors such a lie? It doesn't come from the Bible, it comes from the pit. God didn't lose at the cross, but gained an eternal victory for whosoever will may come. He was made sin on that cross. He didn't become a sinner on the cross. He was the sin offering. And that word is used uh, for, in, in the Old Testament Greek text, for sin or sin offering. It's governed by the context. The Savior who knew no sin was sin bearer and offering. The animals in the Old Testament were dumb and innocent victims, but our Savior is never described as a victim. He is rather victor over sin, death, Satan, and all the powers of darkness. We need to be careful that we are not guilty of willy-nilly compromise on such fundamental and key issues in the word that govern right doctrine and present a savior to the people of God who came through for us with total victory. Further, we cannot penetrate with our minds into the mystery about the redemptive transaction within the Godhead. We're not going to comprehend that. But what occurred while on that cross will be the subject of our inquiry and worship for all eternity. The last thing here, and I won't get through all of this. Did Jesus suffer a spiritual death on the cross? Is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, divisible? When we say that Jesus Christ suffered the penalty for our sin, what do we mean? If people mean that Jesus died spiritually, then what would happen if such were possible? Now watch, we're going to list these things. Number one, it would mean that Christ died spiritually as did the first Adam. Number two, Christ would have no life in God if he died spiritually now. He would cease to have faith in God. The Lord Jesus could no longer love and obey the Father, no longer be filled with the Spirit without measure or be led by the Spirit. He would also necessarily cease carrying out the holy divine purposes for which he was offering himself up to God. How could he be in defeat on the cross and be fulfilling the purposes of God? By dying spiritually, he would renounce his place in the Trinity, that is, die to his deity. It's not possible. He could not die spiritually and remain the Holy Son of God. Spiritual death is spiritually dying to all the life he had in the Spirit. Number nine, Satan is dead to God. But so are all people without Christ. To, pro to propose that Christ should become as the devil is by spiritual death in order to redeem from sin and the devil, certainly would be agreeable to Satan. 
because that would be the fall of our Savior. Spiritual death, number 10, would mean even more for Christ since there was infinitely more of him to die. Do you understand that? Our Lord Jesus Christ is eternal and infinite. How long would it take him to die a spiritual death? Infinitely. Say, all right, some of this is flying over my head. No, well, the implications of the way people think turn into these thoughts. And it's scary when people get this wrong. As he is an infinite and eternal person, his spiritual death would be infinite and eternal. Why? Some people are, may be sitting here right now who are sharp theologians, and you might say, well, he only died according to his humanity. But listen to me. You can't disunite or untie his deity and his humanity. He's one person. And so you can't have the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity going off into failure and sin and not tear apart who the very person of God is. With the Godhead thus broken up, with death having entered it, its unity and spiritual life would be gone forever. God would no longer be God. That's essentially what's being said when anybody says Christ died a spiritual death or that God, the Son, or the God, the Father, was separated from God, the Son. I mean, that's an awful thing to do and it's, and it, and it's laughable that anybody would even think such a thing. Therefore, and by the way, I've read this material. People say this. Therefore, is the spiritual de uh, death of the Son possible? Absolutely not. Surely a dead person in the Godhead is the greatest of contradictions. If Christ had died spiritually, this would finally proclaim that he never was deity. His incarnation did not change his nature as essentially God the Son. It is impossible to defend the view that it is possible for a person of the triune God to die spiritually. The Godhead consists of three interpersonalities. They have such an interrelationship that, it, that you can't divide them. They are interconscious. Now look, Ruth and I have been married 56 years. We are not interconscious. Uh, we know things about each other, and we can almost predict the way the, the other person is going to behave, and we can almost finish sentences for each other. Uh, you know who can do that? Uh, Steve and Wendy, my, my daughter Wendy and her husband Steve. Uh, they, one will start saying something, the other one will finish a sentence. Well, when you're married together long enough, uh, that closeness begins to exhibit that, that kind of uh, um, a connection and that kind of love. So, uh, but that is still not inner conscious because I can't enter my wife's mind and think all her thoughts. She can't enter my mind <laughs> and think all my thoughts. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do that infinitely. And so they have a completely insep they're inseparable in fellowship and indestructible in unity and the special assault of sin upon the Trinity by means of the crucifixion of the Son could not possibly result in its disruption. I wonder if I should get you up and do jumping jacks right now. This is what I used to do in Greek class. I could see I was losing them. And, uh, well, we got a couple here that couldn't do jumping jacks today, could we? Huh? But maybe we need to stand up and sing a chorus or something and just get through the rest of this. But the Trinity could endure the assault of sin upon the Savior. Think about that. In fact, there was no possible way for sin to be carried by our Savior unless it were supernaturally laid upon him to begin with. As the devil was made to face the Son of God in the wilderness, listen to this one. As the devil was made to face the Son of God in the wilderness to go down in defeat, Satan went down in defeat, so sin and Satan were made to face total defeat by Jesus Christ, accomplish what he accomplished 
himself, uh, in himself as the sin bearer. The murder of the incarnate son could not go beyond his physical death. For he proved to be an invincible stronghold against all the effect which demon, man, and sin could bring to bear upon him. In no way and in no place was God found wanting when the death of the incarnate one came to pass. Sin's power is very great, but its power of disintegration is not infinite, as is the indestructible unity of the Trinity. Escape from these conclusions is sought by some saying, it was but a temporary spiritual death which Jesus suffered. Champion says, where in the scriptures is this taught? There's going to be a lot of silence. When the Redeemer himself is thought to be spiritually dead, there can be no super Redeemer to redeem him. Still others maintain that Christ had to remain spiritually dead only as long as it took for him to pay for the spiritual death of mankind. God does not impose spiritual death. Satan and his minions, the fallen angels, demons, sinned and incurred eternal death. Likewise, spiritual death is uniquely the result of sin's poison and infection inside human beings. Christ bore sin by being sinned against. And spiritual death has never once come or resulted by being sinned against. Christ did not, you know, when somebody sins against you, that's not your sin. Unless you provoke them and they sin against you. The Bible says that he did no sin. Since the scriptures tell us that in him all things consist, that is, hold together. He holds the very universe. The universe must have flashed out of existence and then again, with Christ's temporary spiritual death, flashed into existence. Once more, we may ask, do the scriptures teach this? The idea that spiritual death was necessary for Christ to bring a spiritual life is an addition to the word of God. It is not found in the word of God. Did Christ die the death we deserve? You hear that a lot. People have gotten up in this pulpit and I didn't know they were going to say that and they preached it. This is practically the same thing over again, namely spiritual death. Clearly the death we deserved and received was spiritual. If Christ actually suffered the penalty of spiritual death that we incurred, then how can he who then fell to sin and failed possibly save us? You think you're getting part of this? Make sure you sign up for it so you can reread it. Okay? Spiritual death is entire helplessness for good spiritually. Then for Christ to suffer a spiritual death is not equivalent to ours in any way. For Christ to die an equivalent death to ours would mean that he died spiritually, was condemned, and had to go to hell for such a penalty. Who would redeem the Redeemer? How long would we spend in hell if there were no Redeemer? How long would we spend in hell? Forever. Eternity. If Christ died spiritually and took the punishment that we deserved, then Christ would have perished. Whence would be our salvation and deliverance? How often do pastors and other Bible teachers say that Christ had to take the penalty and punishment that we deserved? Well, how does that help mankind if Christ did exactly what you and I do with sin, and sin overcame us. And then, well, then sin had to overcome Christ on the cross. That, he succumbed to sin and spiritual death. We have no Savior. But that's not true, is it? He took our sin upon himself and his body on that cross to utterly defeat it. Christ offered up himself an acceptable sacrifice because his blood, his sacrificial life, his sin-destroying spirit and power is that which God desired as effective in putting away sin. A spiritual death or a spiritually dead Christ could not possibly be an acceptable offering to the God of life eternal. And he could not then be to him a sacrifice at all. For the spiritually dead one could not offer himself in sacrifice to God. This claim that Christ had to die our spiritual death to redeem us is an invention of some other than Christ's spirit and other than the Holy One who inspired the Scriptures. Would it not be a strange thing that what called for the greatest ability, as in our Savior, in every way, is instead supposed to be secured 
by the very greatest disability and disaster? Hmm. Spiritual life for us could not possibly come from spiritual death in Christ. Some have preached as if the word of God or word of the Lord said that as the Lord hung on the cross, the Father not only smote him with spiritual death, but also divine anger poured out the vials of holy wrath upon him. In righteous judgment of hot displeasure, he pronounced him accursed. In utter wrath with him, he turned his back upon him. And because he was in the sinner's place, the Father forsook, abandoned, and left him to the bitterness of spiritual death. That stuff is preached. Such people do not preach a victorious Savior. How different it is to read the Scriptures. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. And again, at the bottom of this page, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect. Does it say imperfect? And being made perfect. He became the author or the cause of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He is perfected in person by his infinite obedience. He is made perfect as the perfect cause of our salvation to all eternity. Well, <clears throat> we're nearing the end here. Let me give you some hope. How far along am I? I'm getting there. I figure if I look this up, it'll give you some breath. Because maybe you're out of breath with me, going like I'm going, like a machine. 77-year-old machine. <clears throat> all the chains and all the parts are going to fall apart after this message. But this man, <clears throat> I mean, this is nothing. Think of Trump. He's doing three a day. Or sometimes five. And he never seems to run out. He's 74. 74. Three years younger than me. <clears throat> and he's not born again yet. <clears throat> so pray for him. He certainly knows about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has witness within his own cabinet. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, that's our Lord Jesus, sat down on the right hand of God. And then it goes on to say, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Would you, would you look at that? Do you hear that about yourself? What about when that day comes and you're on your deathbed? Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Beloved, you're safe. You're safe. Jesus won. And then it says, now where remission or forgiveness is, there is no more offering for sin. There remains no more sacrifice for sin because Jesus did it all. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We have arrived at the end. Conclusions. The Father did not forsake the Son when he was dying for the sins of the world. Number two. The Father did not turn his back on the Son or turn away his face. The Son did not die a spiritual death on the cross, but was fully victorious over sin. The end. Now you know something? You might say to me, why couldn't you just say those three points to begin with and forget about 10 or 11 messages? Well, I could say those three things, but if you're going to trust me, shouldn't it be coming from the scripture? Shouldn't there be some kind of sound, logical, spiritual logic in this? Believe me, this wasn't all thought up by myself. I depended on other resources and listed the main one there, but I've quoted even some things from John's book, and 
you'll find those things there. And uh, you can always ask for a copy of this for your uh, PowerPoint. We have a Savior, and that'll never change. He is ours when we accept Him into our life to be our Lord, Savior, and Master. He cannot fail. He did not fail at the cross. He could not fail. His resurrection proved that what He said when He said it is finished is exactly correct. It's true forever. He presented Himself alive for 40 days with many infallible proofs to His immediate disciples and to others, many others. The Savior who's living in your heart and my our heart right now is the key to our life on earth and He is our, our entrance into heaven. I am the door, he said. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find fellowship. Wherever you go in, wherever you go out, you're going to be linked in fellowship with Christ. He's the only door. He's the only way, truth, and life. What a Savior to endure all that for us and win for us something that doesn't last uh, until we fail the next time or fail the time after that. But His salvation is forever. And the Lord will never revoke that from the least of His children not the one who suffers the greatest failures. He will never take it away if you were really, truly born again, again in Christ. That's not to encourage failures. We're not saying we should live like the devil now and because we're secure in Christ. Because you know something? When the Lord comes in, He puts inside of you an aversion, a disgust, for sin. Even while you may be committing sin, you should feel a sense of repulsion and disgust because the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. If that re revulsion and, and being repulsed and that upset with ourselves is not there, then we need to recheck whether or not we are actually born again. And that's important. Of all things in this world, we want to be sure of our salvation. Now listen, and when you're sure of your salvation, you can be sure that the Lord Jesus Christ will keep you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the patience of the saints today. And we commit this study, choppy as it, as it was, Lord, just bring it before you, and you're the one that will approve or here and there disapprove, and Father, we do our utmost in dependence upon the Holy Spirit but we know that unless this is of the Lord, it's not worth anything. Thank you for how precious thy word is. And may the word of God be the judge of the very contents of these notes that are on these slides. Because your word is held above all as the written authority for our lives and the incarnated word, our Savior. Lord, we thank you for the 
the helpful and loving critic that you are in our lives, along with the work of the Holy Spirit, who roots so deep down into our lives with conviction that he goes into the depths of the soul and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the motives of the heart. Thank you, Lord. And we pray now that as we come to the Lord's table, that you would bless as we share together, remembering what you've done and looking forward to your coming again. As we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.